Our next speaker is Christine Gama. Uh, Christine, yeah, I saw you here. Uh, thanks for joining. So yeah. let, me, let me introduce Christine. Uh, Chris, Christine Gama is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at U, UT Austin and a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Her research in computer vision and uh, machine learning focuses on visual recognition and search. So uh, welcome um, and please, okay, I see your screen and uh, please go ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all the organizers for having me here. And um, I'm excited to tell you about some of our work. The work I'm gonna share is focused on where audio can play a role for understanding 3D environments. Um, and I'm gonna highlight a bunch of recent work from the group um, in this realm and keeping it fairly high level just to ensure that we can touch on a number of different things. Um, this talk does have audio and I think it's going to work fine, but we'll find, we'll, um, I'll ask for your feedback when I get to my first audio clip to make sure everyone's hearing properly. Okay. So, of course, you know, in the context of this workshop and in the context of important work that's going on between computer vision and robotics and other areas of perception, we know that it's quite exciting and also important to be able to model the needs for perception in the context of the need for action and vice versa. And so this is the realm that we're talking about here, kind of perception action loop and embodied AI problems that deal with navigating, exploring, searching, using a space. So that's the broad context. And we also know that thanks to a lot of very exciting work, there's so much more that can be done now, including with deep learning and deep reinforcement learning in order to take egocentric RGBD images and make sense of a new environment that hasn't already been mapped. And this has in part been um, you know, twofold happening because of algorithm development. It's also happening because of very strong realistic simulator development on, uh, for 3D environments. And this will allow agents then to do things like navigate to a new space before, you know, at the same time that they're figuring out what the space is like. Uh, and you can see that, for example, here, where in an egocentric view received on the left, the agent starts building a map um, and implicit or explicit in order to be able to do things like find a specified target. So now, despite all this progress, what we do notice is that these have been silent environments and deaf agents. So in the simulation platforms that are really driving progress here, like in Matterport 3D or Replica or Gibson or others, um, you're, you're getting very high fidelity visual experiences for these agents, but Again, they're, they're deaf and they're not hearing things about the space. And so this is the thing that we'd like to zero in on uh, and think about how sound is important for such agents who have tasks like I've mentioned and specifically how it's important for understanding a 3D space and the geometry of a space. So we think at a high level, this can be several things. So one, it can be finding a target. So something's happening in an environment and it's somewhere I can't see, but I could hear it from afar. This is something that we ought to be able to handle. Um, also sound is gonna reveal activity about things that are happening, events, acoustic events elsewhere in a 3D space. Sound reveals semantics. So objects look a certain way. They also often sound a certain way. And so even when I hear something, I can start to attach semantic labels or categories to it, possibly in conjunction with what I see. And finally, most basically sound is giving a signal about geometry itself and the materials of a space. Okay, so this is not exhaustive, but a good collection of things that we ought to gain from once we're able to perceive sound and then learn from it together with our visual stream. Now, spatial effects and audio have kind of two fronts. One front is the environment itself. So the big 3D structures, the walls, the large furniture even, these are all geometries that are going to affect how we receive sound, depending where we're standing in an environment. Similarly, the materials of each of those structures, that'll affect how the sound propagates, how we hear it, and how we're positioned with respect to any of the sources of sound. So that's one front. Now, the other front is the body of the agent. So in our agent bodies, meaning humans, we have two ears, and this is significant for allowing us to sense uh, sound spatially. Because you know, if I receive two different waveforms to my right and left ear, then the slight time delay between those, the slight intensity difference between those is gonna give me signals about the spatial 
position of the source that is uh, emitting the sound. Even the shape of my ears will affect and allow me to sense in more 3D way where the sound is coming from. So this is a human uh, agent, same thing for our robots. Once they have more than one microphone, we can explicitly sense spatial sound. All right, so this is kind of the, the sensing about sound, giving us information about the 3D environment. Now to be able to study this in a reproducible and highly realistic way, we've augmented existing 3D visual assets with sound assets. And this is a public data set we released last year called Sound Spaces. And you can think of it as a, a rendering platform that's pre-computed for Matterport and replica environments, such that you can insert a microphone uh, for your agents anywhere in this space and hear the proper binaural, meaning two ear sounds in real time. And it'll be acoustically correct in terms of respecting the geometry, the walls, the transmission coefficients, et cetera. And you can do that for any sound you like. Um, and meanwhile, you can also do this in, in a way that's compatible with Habitat. So this is a kind of a platform that got us started looking at problems with 3D spatial sound. And now you're able to, as I said, insert an agent and, and hear things properly, just as you can already insert agents in these environments and see things properly. So here's a, just a little taste of what that's like. And here's where I need to know, um, please, if you cannot hear what I'm playing just now, here you go. Okay, so I hope that you could hear in this sample. Um, this is an example from Sound Spaces in a Matterport environment where the objects were sounding, the piano and then a smoke alarm, and the sounds would get louder as you get closer to them. Meanwhile, if you wore headphones and listened to our source audio, you'll hear the directionality of the sound as well. So I'll pause for one moment. If you could not hear me, please, if you could not hear the video, please let me know because I'll have more in the following slides. I'm thinking then we're good, so I'll continue. Now that's an example of Sound Spaces running. It also hints at the very first task that we wanted to tackle with it, which is navigation. You know, there was a smoke alarm. Where was it? The agent had to search to find it. And so we think about this as a, a first task for an agent to learn how to both see and use its sight and sound to navigate to a sounding object. And keep in mind that object can be in another room. And what's great about sound is that it'll come through doorways or walls. So as this heat map suggests, the sound emanating from an open door of the room in which it is located will reach an agent. That'll be something it can learn to follow in order to travel to the right place, even in an unmapped, unseen environment. So I'll briefly describe kind of the first deep reinforcement learning approach we built to tackle this AV navigation. Um, so as input, you have vision, RGBD, you have from the audio binaural spectrograms, one for each ear, and then optionally you have GPS odometry. Now these are all coming in as input and then we'll learn features on top of them that are targeting this navigation task. And this is a recurrent network for reinforcement learning agent that will learn how to select actions at every step of its experience. And these actions are gonna be movements. So move forward, turn left, turn right. And it's going to have a loop here where after each action is selected, the environment updates what the agent sees and hears, uh, and then the process continues. So of course the goal for our agent is to learn how to choose those actions such that it's gonna to get to that sounding target. And so during training, we reward the agent for getting to the target, big reward if you get there and furthermore, incremental rewards as you get closer to the target. So this will yield an agent that knows how to move smartly in the environment so that it finds the sounding object, no matter uh, what the object is. So this could be across different object categories. And we also are interested in the case where uh, odometry is not a given. And so I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. All right, so this is a basic reinforcement learning loop. It gives you an agent that knows how to leverage its spatial hearing about the 3D environment in order to both navigate and search to uh, uh, the, the target itself. Okay, so does it help or how does it help? Well, certainly it does help using this additional modality. So if I 
have an agent that's only doing traditional point goal tasks, meaning it's told to go to some Delta XY and it can see, and it even has GPS. Um, in an episode like this here, you're looking at a top-down map of some environment where the whites occupy space, the gray is free space. The agent in this case, you know, bumped around this wall on the left-hand side rather than take something closer to the shortest path, which is shown in pink, to get from the starting position at the top to the target position in yellow. If this was a failure example, well, what's happening, it's just using that odometry too heavily to say, well, I'm trying to get to that yellow spot, delta X, delta Y, and um, it runs out of time in the episode to do so. And correspondingly, the success rates in navigation are, are low. Now, if you add sound, again, remember that visual I gave of sound bleeding through a doorway. Well, we're not gonna hand code that, but with the policy I just described, you learn to follow that kind of sound gradient as well. And so the agent in this case succeeds in, in getting out of that room so that it can travel all the way down to the goal. And correspondingly, success rates in navigation are quite a bit higher. Okay, so we can see that sure enough, you know, if we have sound, it tells us something about the 3D environment and it'll help us find the, uh, a source. And it's kind of um, nice to see for the, the real use case, right? If there's a phone ringing or an alarm going, we don't need someone to tell us where it is, we can hear it and we'll travel to it. Now, a couple of things looking a little deeper at the results. So one is, you know, what do the audio features code for? They're, they're trained for navigation to these targets. And then what happens if you look at them um, here with a TC projection, just in 2D for two properties. So on the left, I've color coded the points according to distance to the goal. And on the right, they're color coded for direction or angle to the goal. And if you look here on the left, what you see is that, you know, the more these colors cluster, it means the features themselves are coding for or revealing that distance, which they are, right? So there's from red to blue, close, or far to close to the goal. And this clustering tells you that the features have determined that it was, you know, useful to know how far you are from the goal by reading the audio signal. It's also useful in the direction, although this comes out a little more in a little more messy manner. Um, but there is still this clustering of the reds and the blues for saying whether the goal is to the right or to the left of the agent. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to show on this part is that there is even good scope for audio, not just to augment what we could do already with traditional uh, navigation masters, including using GPS, but to even replace, right? To think of audio as a strong directional and navigational signal. So what this chart does is add increasing GPS noise such that agents that really rely on it, like the one in blue, um, the existing one is gonna um, you know, fall apart really because of the poor GPS odometry. Whereas using sound actually keeps that more stable. And furthermore, using only sound and vision and not relying at all on the GPS will be completely immune to that GPS noise um, and even stable with respect to some audio noise. So this I think is quite exciting because it means that um, the audio is doing its job for a spatial signal. And in the, in the event of these indoor environments where GPS is just not reliable, it can step in. Okay, so next I wanna talk about semantics. So um, the, the example I showed so far, we were navigating to an object sound source. It actually wasn't visible. Um, you know, it was, well, there was a phone ringing or there was an, a smoke alarm there. Um, but we were really thinking of it as a sounding target that we need to get to, and we'll succeed when we're right by it. Now let us think about um, enhancing this problem statement to care about finding semantically meaningful objects that make semantically meaningful sounds. And we call this semantic audiovisual navigation to distinguish from the, the target-based audio, audio navigation I just described. And this is work appearing at the main conference this year. So as I said, the goal is to find these semantically meaningful objects. Furthermore, we're gonna add complexity to the task by allowing these sounds to stop. So what I just showed you, you know, the alarm kept going until we found it. Now imagine as it does in the world, there's sound events that happen, but they're not persistent. And you still need to be able to intelligently navigate to where you think you heard them and, and recognize them once you see them. So that means we're gonna do a couple of things. We'll associate meaningful sounds to objects. So alarm clocks will sound like alarm clocks, dishes, washing dishes will sound like dishes and so on. And so the first step that we did was to enhance SoundSpace's platform to have sounds associated with an array of 21 different objects from Matterport 3D. So here's just a couple examples then what you get. 
First one is going to be um, uh, test of doors. Okay, and again, it stopped because it won't be a constant sound, but that was a sound associated with that one. And then here's a toilet flushing existing in Matterport. Okay, so now these sounds in the platform are registered in the proper places for the visual object. And that gives us a chance then to learn the association between how things look and how they sound. So think about these navigating agents who are gonna be you know, exploring and also um, doing targeted searches in these environments. And it's very important that they could discover this leak. And I'm gonna show you results that accentuate that to say, you know, once we know both how it sounds and it looks, then we're in a good position as they, for example, if they stop sounding and we're still looking for it, we can recognize it. Or if we can't see it yet because we're in the wrong room, but we can hear it, we can start building a mental model, we being the agent, for what the thing is that we're probably looking for. So for example, if I'm over here in some other room and I hear um, uh, uh, the toilet flushing, then I would know as I go searching for it, what the thing looks like, even though I haven't seen it yet. So that both directions, that's what we're gonna try and capture. And the second key part of our idea is to bring in, you know, enhance in certain ways the model I already showed to allow a long-term memory that will handle these sporadic acoustic events. And so the cartoon of what'll happen then for semantic AV navigation is shown below where, you know, suppose the agent's down at number, position number one, seeing what's in front of it. And here's water dripping um, and thinks, you know, maybe the general direction is to the right. And then upon seeing a couple objects that are relevant, like a sink and a shower, it's got a prior of where it might go travel to, to, to investigate further. But then the sound may stop. And so again, the, the model should keep a record of the likely visual appearance, given what the sound was, and then eliminate other possibilities. And in this case, you know, maybe zero into the sink, which was the source of the dripping water. Okay, so that's an, an instance, a cartoon really of a episode of semantic AV navigation. And let me just say a little bit about the model that tries to bring in those elements I just described. So like before, we've got RGBD coming in. We've got the last action we took as input and we have binaural spectrogram. And we'll have some encoders learned for processing all those input streams. But now something different, we have what we call a goal descriptor network. And so in the task I just described, it's a really key that the agent be able to keep estimating what is the thing it thinks it heard, so what's the object label, and where is it? So neither of those things are given. We just hear something in the environment and we're supposed to find it. And so it's gonna constantly update its estimates of here denoted L and C, the location of the object relative to the agent and the category of the object. So that'll be predicted. And you know, my example, maybe it's the sink and it's 10 meters Northwest. Now, then uh, the policy will take um, this memory and apply through a transformer uh, some self-attention in order to reason about the important parts of the environment for this task. And then it'll take with the decoded output as well as the, the goal descriptor estimate uh, to create the current state estimate, which then goes back into this loop for selecting actions movement actions to take, and then um, the resulting loop comes back to update the observations given where we moved. So the key things in this thing, this approach, two, two things. So one is the goal descriptor that is explicitly trying to constantly update those locations and objects we're looking for. And then the transformer, which enhances this architecture to really be able to handle sporadic and stopping acoustic events. Okay, and this approach works quite well. Um, I'm gonna not spend much time on the result, but here are success rates, high is good. And this is our approach that I just described in um, compared to a, a set of baselines, including our own prior work that I alluded to earlier in this talk, um, as well as some others in the meantime. Uh, and so we're seeing very good improvements, both in heard sounds or unheard sounds. Meaning, you know, there's new sounds at test time you've never experienced during training. Though that, course, that, that case, of course, is harder. So let's look at one example of an episode where he, the agent is trying to find a chest of drawers. 
doesn't know this, it just starts listening and then hears what sounds like a chest of drawers and then it stops and then it goes to find it visually. Okay, so the sound stopped, um, but again, it's learned that link between what it thought it heard and what it should see. And so it finds this bed stand, which has a chest of drawers. Okay. Now, so far in these navigation tasks, you might have noticed that there was not a lot of competing sounds. In fact, in the examples I showed, there were none, um, although we have tested them with distractor sounds. Now let us think exactly about the case where you're in a busy household, there's more than one thing going on, um, and there's sounds you care about and sounds you don't care about. And in fact, we want to be able to isolate a sound of interest in the midst of other N distractor sounds that are ongoing. So suppose you want to hear what someone's saying somewhere in the house, but there's also a dishwasher running and a dog barking, etc. Now, to really hear what someone is saying, it might make you think about the task of source separation, audio source separation. And this is um, a well-known task that's had a resurgence in the audiovisual literature lately in order to take video that has multiple things making sounds, often people speaking, and trying to isolate one sound from the other. It's a great problem. It's a great AV problem because you can imagine how both the sound and the vision come together. And the better you understand how they work together, you can separate out the sounds. For example, reading the lips of the person whose sound you want to hear. And there's been a lot of great work looking at this task. Now, it's been looking at the task in video, right? So this is not embodied, this is passive, um, where the video itself is already pre-recorded. There's nothing you can do to change it. You cannot move the camera, you can't move the microphone in order to, to tackle the task. And so this is really a certain class of the problem. And what we're proposing now is to think of the active perception version of audio source separation. So we'd like to think of this as a problem where the agent has control over itself and its goal now is not to find an object or find an object that's making sound, but to be in a place where it can hear the object well. And I mean, hear it well such that it can produce the correct latent sound that that object is producing, ignoring all the others. So, you know, hear the speaker, the human speaker, ignore the dog and the dishwasher. That'll be the correct output. And here's a little cartoon for what we're after then. So if the agent were starting at the star in this picture um, and there's three sound sources, say S1, S2, S3, and the one it cares about is S3. Maybe there's someone sitting in that chair speaking. Then, you know, it could stand there at the star and hear all these sounds and, you know, suffer through it. Um, but better is if the agent can move intelligently to get to the place where it's very easy to hear S3. And I should stress, this doesn't mean move to S3. We actually can show very clearly that navigating to the target object is not the solution to hear it best. For example, in this case, the agent's better off moving around that kitchen island to the position there so that it's blocking some of the sounds from S1 and S2 while being in a good position to hear the sound from S3. Okay, but that requires some new motion policy, right? To know, well, where am I supposed to move when I want to hear um, an object better. So that's what we've attempted to do. And so, um, you know, I've been showing you a few of these RL loops before. This one has some of that context from before, um, but now is uh, different in two important ways. So one way, one way is that we'll have now a separator network within this model. So a network whose job is to try and take the sound here at the top and disentangle it as best it can into the, the mixed components in order to isolate that target sound, okay? And as best it can, because this will be an iterative process as it observes more and more sound and as it moves around in the space. So we have this separator network. The other key difference is now the agent's not rewarded for getting to a target during training. It's rewarded for doing good separation of sound. And so in this case, then the second module in this network is the controller that is doing the smart motions. Um, now taking at every time step, both what it can see and hear, as well as what the current estimate of the separated sound is from the top module that's been trained to do audio separation. Okay, so then again, you know, think 
This is generally uh, still our RL, deep RL loop that's doing this action selection and evolving every time step to see new and, and hear new things. But again, that key second difference is that the, the agent is rewarded for doing good separation. Okay, we call this whole approach move to hear. So you're gonna move intelligently in order to hear better. Let me show you one instance of this at work. Um, first, we're gonna hear the monoral ground truth. So this is what the agent's supposed to recover. And it's like the true sound, the sound without all these distractors, just the thing that it should try to hear purely. So here it is. In this case, it's very short, so listen. And it was so thoughtful. Okay, so it's someone speaking. Um, and then this is the mixed binaural sound that the agent hears at the start. Mixed meaning it's got some clutter distractor sounds with it. Movie well together. Thought. Okay, so you, if you heard it closely, you'll hear both that speaker, but now someone else speaking over them and some other noise. And then on the right, what I'll show is the egocentric view of the agent in the middle, and then the top-down view of the environment, which the agent doesn't yet have. It must recover as it goes. And it's got distractor sounds are placed at the red squares. The agent is the arrow. And the target sound is in a green circle, but you'll notice that's where the agent starts. And then it needs to reposition itself to hear that source better. And so that's what it's it doing so here. Thoughtful. And it was so thoughtful. So you're hearing that the target slowly sound better as the agent refines its estimate. And it was so thoughtful. So remember, it started with that mixed sound that sounded very cluttery with other speakers. And now the last one you heard is what it ends up with. And it found that it was good to stand in a certain place behind a wall. Um, near the target, not at it, but in such a way that's blocking some of those distractor sounds. Okay, so it had intelligent behavior to disentangle target sounds. And of course, we can quantify all of this and look at other baseline things you might do, like have the agent stand in one place or rotate around or search, steer its microphones towards the direction of arrival of the sound, random motions, even common novelty-based exploration measures. And overall, we're getting some encouraging results doing this intelligent policy to learn how to move to here. Right, uh, and then the final minute or two, I'll, I'll show you um, one last example briefly, which is an audiovisual floor plan. So I'm gonna keep this part short. Um, given a short video, we wanna know, can we recover the layout of an entire home? If you do a vision, there's only so much you can do. So in my case over here, if you see the camera cones in blue, um, it's a short video, and so there's plenty of the home that's never even seen. So how would you reconstruct it? Whereas, if you can listen to this environment and hear the TV playing in what might be a living room or kitchen sounds coming from what might be the kitchen, and even um, understanding the rays of sound bouncing around such that they indicate where free space exists behind the camera. If you can do those things, our idea is you'll be able to more fully estimate both the ground plane map of that environment, as well as even a semantic label map saying what rooms are where. And so that was our goal. And we've trained a model I'm not gonna have time to go into that will extrapolate maps based on the audio and the visual. And in fact, it does this better than state-of-the-art visual extrapolation of these maps from our own prior work. Um, so that you get a fuller map with very, very short videos uh, estimating where the, the rooms end and what kind of rooms they are. And I'll just show you one video example and then we'll close. Uh, so in this example, you're gonna hear some environmental sounds, that's what the agent hears. And then it's building out its map on the right-hand side. And at the end, I'll compare it to the visual only map. Okay, so that you can see the map growing pretty quickly as the agent moves because it can hear again, hear free space even behind the camera because of the sound, what it's learned about sound, um, as well as understanding semantics of the rooms. Uh, if you just did ground plane projections from depth maps, you would get the cyan map on the right hand side, which you'll notice is much smaller than the map you're able to get correctly from using sound together with vision. All right, so I'm gonna close here. I've talked all about some of our recent work in 3D environment understanding from sound and vision together. Um, includes the Sound Spaces platform, navigation challenges, um, new work in audio source separation and floor plan reconstruction. 
And this is work with a, a lot of other collaborators. I'm highlighting um, the students and my postdoc who are behind, uh, you know, first authors in all of the work that I showed you today. Thanks so much for your attention and glad to have questions now or offline. Thanks, Christine, for the wonderful talk. We can have questions from the audience. You can either unmute or ask questions in the chat box. I see one question from Brad. Uh, can you simulate, can your simulated data set include multiple directional microphones? Yeah, it does. So right now what we've prepared is um, binaural and ambisonic. So we have um, the two ear, two ear microphone modeling also the, the shape of the human ears, which we often use in our results because it's pleasing for human listeners. And then we've also used ambisonic, which um, is more omnidirectional sound recovery in the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, Brent uh, raised the hand. You can um, unmute and ask questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. First, this is great work. Um, one thing I'm wondering is just thinking that maybe you want to employ this in like an embodied agent or a robot in an environment. Do you think it would be, ever be possible, even in the absence of sounds from the environment, to have the robot use sonar or make sounds itself and then try to use that to get information about the environment around it? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I didn't present um, our work in that regard. We have looked at what we call visual echoes where we can learn by having the agent emit sounds. Um, and then learn how to better predict depth in the environment. We've also done this in the floor plan stuff I just you know, kind of breezed through where we considered environmental sounds as presumably the harder case, but also the agent emitted sounds where the agent just keeps moving and you know, probing the environment with its own emitted sound, which is more controlled. Um, so we've looked at it in those specific ways and in sound spaces, this is supported as far as the simulation goes because you can place the source and receiver at the same position and, and read out the, the proper audio response. Thank you. And Andrew, you can ask questions. Yeah. Uh, professor, a uh, great presentation. Uh, my question is, so right now uh, you're dealing with uh, indoor environments and how much can it generalize? For example, you have a certain type of wooden desk. It, if it hears from a different type of desk or different type of alarm clock, um, can it still navigate? Or if you add more training data so that it can handle that, is it possible to do it in real time? Ah, uh, yeah. So I think your question hits on a few things. And you know, one is indoor outdoor, because um, as you noted, it, these have all been indoor and, um, you know, getting the simulations alone outdoor would be a different challenge and not supported by what we've done so far. Um, and then there's like the object variety that you mentioned where, um, you know, we have a mm, you know, modest, I guess, guess, set of audio clips attached to these 21 objects, but you could think of expanding those because like you said, um, it's not like we have modeled materials of the environment itself, which would include the wooden desk, um, but the sounds we're placing in are object specific. And so, um, you know, the, the wider the array of those during training would allow, I think, respectively, you know, more generalization to say, here's all the ways that someone writing on a desk might sound like or, or, or otherwise. Um, so there's that. And then actually the last thing you mentioned in your question now I've lost. Real time, is it, I mean, if we include yeah. all the different varieties, is it still possible to do it in real time, the navigation? Mm, yeah, so the that's right. And we're, by the way, we're working hard, but not there yet for translating the sim to real, you know, experiments from learning over here and simulation to the real robot where this will become even more important um, to demonstrate, right? Um, the simulator itself is real time because it's all pre-computed at this stage, meaning, um, no matter what the, you know, the waveform coming in, that's always the same cost on top of what's already pre-computed, which are these room impulse responses. So the number of sounds that you want to play won't change that performance. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. We can have last question from Changshu, um, please ask. Yeah, I have a question. So echo sounds makes, like, makes the agents confused to find the goal. So I would like to hear your thoughts about effects of the echo sounds. Okay, yeah, so you're saying what what do we get from the echoes? Oh, so like depends on the like surrounding walls, mm -hmm. you may be like confused to the agents. So how do you think about like these conditions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I think it's largely a feature because um, 
because we do have these agents in environments that they've not mapped before. So they're not yet aware of where obstacles are, including walls. And so at the same time, it's doing a search to an object or a target, it's doing mapping. And so this, so what I mean by it's a feature is like being able to learn or, or anticipate in advance of colliding with the wall that walls are in certain orientations and places from the sound is what's helping to boost the mapping beyond, you know, or in addition to the visual now, especially when it's behind the camera, right? Because um, the vision part is quite good at doing this kind of mapping as well if it's in the field of view. Um, so I think largely that's what's a win for the reconstruction and the mapping part of it. Whether it would deteriorate the, the semantics of sounds that are, you know, you're caring about for finding the target. I don't think we have any specific evidence of that. Um, but I guess, um, yeah, but only because we're, we are dealing with these unmapped environments, like I said, so it is, I think it's largely a signal for us. I mean, when we've looked specifically at echoes from agent emitted sounds, which isn't work I presented here, um, then we were finding that it helped us to learn representations that are predictive of depth, even better than we can predict from mono, uh, monocular RGB. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank Christian again, and then we move.